think, girl. Try to remember. This is your own... Where am I? Well, this clearly isn't Tokyo. dreaming I was leaving school and then I need to get home the words and actions of his classmates serve to increase his loneliness but he is used to it the sun doesn't shine anymore. It's... broken. When you finish this restoration, you'll get a fun surprise. What's wrong with the moon? I'll collect all of the fragments. And then... strange message on my phone. Damn. It won't turn on. I guess I'm walking. Sleepy buns. Sleepy buns? Wait, you can talk? Who are you? How do you know my... Oh, don't worry your pretty head about any of that. And for now, you can just call me Mama. Hurry up now. Off we go. Um, this is the way I came in. 
Oh. Whoopsies. Sorry about that. We'll go the right way this time. Mind telling me what's going on? Also, how do I get home? Oh, don't fret about home, dear. Just let Mama be your guide. You're not answering my questions. Here now, hop on the elevator. <sighs> What's going on? Where are we? Oh, geez, so many questions. Well, for starters, you're in the cage. But I'm afraid no one really knows anything else about it. <sighs> it's like I've wandered into a video game. Actually, wasn't there a mobile game that looked like this? I think it was called Reincarn- <clears throat> Are you alright? Um, I feel like this black thing might be important. Hmm. Ah, yes, right. Silly mama. We need to deal with the dark scarecrow here. Your job is to restore the past that's recorded inside this scarecrow. There's no bread for slackers in this world, so hop to it now! Chop chop! Restore the past? What does that even mean? W what the heck? Lips draw tight in an attempt to mask uneasy eyes. A wavy-haired girl gazes up at the towering building before her. It smells sweetly of old books, worn paper, cracked leather. As the girl moves, she wonders if she has somehow found her way into one of her childhood cradle tales. This is a school for youngsters who show promising aptitude in the ways of magic. The professor gives her a pamphlet outlining the day's schedule. It also contains her first lesson. A handful of simple spells she is expected to master. A feast of almost unbelievable bounty awaits the new students in the dining hall.
partway through the hall, she encounters a shy, bespectacled student crying softly to herself. It seems some cruel boys have stolen her dinner. Don't worry, says the new girl. I'll get it back for you. She and the other girl make their way to the end of the dining hall. There, they find the boys clutching stolen heels of bread. Vile sneers spread wide across their faces. Give it back, says the girl. The girl thinks for a moment. Then she decides to teach the boys a lesson, using one of the magics from her pamphlet. But the spell is all flash and dazzle, and the laughing boys easily repel it. The girl gives the spiky-haired boy a brief thanks, even though she felt the issue was well in hand. The boy smiles proudly, and rushes off to rejoin the feast. Having so recently been peeled from their families, every heart in the room is filled with unease. But the smell of good, warm food causes all tension to melt away. The three exchange bashful glances, embarrassed at the way they all spoke at once. Each one feels part of something larger than themselves. Almost as if they were starting a new family. I get it now. So you're saying the thing I saw was a record of the past? In that case, I clearly need to defeat the dark enemies in my way in order to restore it. Oh, jeez, you figured that out so fast! It's almost scary how clever you are. Can I return to Tokyo if I defeat all the dark bad guys? Oh, who knows? Let's just keep going and find out. <sighs> We need to clear this black wall out of the way. Just do the same thing you did last time. Ooh, someone has a message from a friend. Hmm? 
my phone is working again. Still messed up. I'd love to help, but I just don't know a thing about technology. should do it. You certainly seem to have a good handle on how to deal with these dark folks. It's not so hard once you get the hang of it. Life at school had remained relatively unchanged throughout the long years. The once young girl now grows ever closer to adulthood. The bell rings out, signaling the start of the day. And she picks up her pace as she runs down the hall. The spectacled student calls out to her, the same one she attempted to rescue all those long years ago. Though she has matured in many ways, she remains as shy as ever. The professor gazes out across the room and begins her lecture. Pledges are a long-held custom for our kind. They allow two who are close to form a pair and pass their magics to each other. Once a pair affirms their feelings for one another, they seal the contract with an avowal ring. 
The day of pledging draws near, and you will all be able to participate if you so desire. The students have heard much about this ritual, and murmur excitedly as the professor adjourns class. A group of boys slowly walk up to the girl with the wavy hair, and offer her gifts of adoration. The girl's mature aura had been garnering popularity for some time, but she has no interest in forming a contract with the boys, and quickly brushes them aside. But then, another student walks in to take their place. It is the spiky-haired boy who shared a meal with the two girls when they were younger. That day led to a friendship between the three that only grew stronger as the years went by. The boy teases the wavy-haired girl, calling her cruel for discarding all of her suitors with such haste. Though playful, she finds his taunts to be irritating. But she knows reacting to them will only make her the subject of further ridicule. The bespectacled girl stifles a laugh at her friend's affectionate bickering. But this sits poorly with the other girl, who whirs around and asks a single question of her friend. The laughter dies, and after a long moment of serious consideration, she finally gives a halting answer. Um, I don't know. I guess I haven't really thought about it. Their conversation is cut short by the ringing of another bell. We're going to be late, says the bespectacled girl as she bolts from the lecture hall. A confused eddy of feelings whirl about in the other girl's heart. But she can only watch as her friends walk away. People sure are complicated. Why can't they just say what they mean and be done with it? Anyway, I'll be able to go back home if I keep doing this, right? A light! Let's head there! <sighs> What's wrong with the moon? Oh, right! See, the moon once held a very special power, but now it's just sort of, um... broken? How do you... 
break a moon. Oh, right. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Let's keep moving. Giant towers and a broken moon? That's enough surprises for one day. Ooh, but I love surprises! Don't you have surprises where you come from? I mean, probably. I've always been too focused on my own goals to worry about that kind of thing. Such a hard worker! Oh, I bet you never get lost like poor Mama here. <laughs> Babe, pal, and don't you forget it. And don't go calling me Baby Boo or Cuddlebug or some crap like that. It's Babe. Got it? Oh, Lord. If word gets out that I brought my child to work, I am done for. Ah. <sighs> On the day of pledging, the city is resplendent with all manner of decorations and colors. The sight causes the wavy-haired girl to practically bounce up and down with excitement. Hurry, she calls to her friends. Let's go before the shops close. Smiling, she leads her friends through the streets. Enticed by the sparkle of the goods, the girl suggests they visit a nearby accessory stall.
with their bespectacled friend called away. The boy and girl suddenly find themselves alone. Let's get going, she says, trying desperately to control the quiver in her voice. I can't let him know how fast my heart is beating. Thoughts and emotions swirl inside the girl like a maelstrom. With all of her senses on the highest of alert, she does not even realize how fast she is moving. The two finally arrive at the pledging plinth, their figures silhouetted by the setting sun. The girl speaks first. She opens her heart to the boy, letting all of her emotions and feelings gush forth in a torrent. Silence stretches out. A moment. An hour. An age. Finally, the boy shakes his head. The girl's heart is immediately drowned in an ocean of despair. The boy manages to form a kind of base apology, his head hanging low all the while. I'm sorry, he says. I never meant to hurt you, but I'm going to make a pact with our best friend. Vision blurs, sound roars, without even realizing it, the girl begins to run, hoping that will somehow stop her tears. When she finally comes to, it is dark. The throngs of people mere suggestions in the shadow. At the sound of approaching footsteps, she turns around. Her friend has returned, none the wiser as to what has transpired. The innocent question pricks at the girl's heart like a thorn. You were my friend. I told you everything. And you kept this from me the entire time. Bewildered, the bespectacled girl attempts to form a response. No, he... he doesn't understand. He doesn't know. Her lips tremble. Her breath halts. He doesn't know I love you. And in the face of this unexpected confession, the wavy-haired girl can only stand and stare. So, what's going on? The girl liked the boy, but he liked someone else, and then... This is why relationships are never worth the trouble. This job. Cram it with walnuts, pal. Ain't nobody gave you permission to speak to Mama. Now, babe, it's all right. Yuzuki is a nice young man. We like Yuzuki. I'm sorry, Mumsy. 
His voice seems quite mature for a baby. Oh, don't I know it. He had to grow up fast to make up for my scatterbrained ways. Uh. And now for an important announcement. When you fix four instances of the past, you'll get paid! So that means you only need... Um... Sorry, which scarecrow is this again? Number four. Ah, uh, right. Oh, I swear I would forget my head if it wasn't screwed on. The wavy-haired girl is stunned. She thought her friends were going to betray her by pledging themselves to each other. But instead, her bespectacled friend has confessed feelings for her. I went out with him once because I didn't know how to get out of it, whispers the bespectacled girl. But it was you. It was always you. The wavy-haired girl is confused, bewildered, overwhelmed. All she can think to do is escape. I hate you, she cries as she flees. I wish you would both just disappear forever. For the next three days, the girl barely eats or sleeps. Her heart aches with regret. Regret that she allowed her emotions to run roughshod. Regret at the horrible things she had said. On the day of pledging, the air in the school is heavy and thick. The professor clears her throat. She lists the students who have pledged themselves to each other. But the girl's friends are nowhere to be found. She watches blankly as one pair after another walk past with joy on their faces. But no matter how much time passes, her friends do not arrive. The professor is clearly troubled by this development. Knowing how close the three are, she asks the girl to search for them. As she runs, the girl comes to a realization. As long as they can both be happy, nothing else matters. She decides then and there to apologize to her friends and to do all she can to support whatever decision they arrive at. Finally, she comes to a door held fast by a strange magic. Concerned, she quickly dispels it and proceeds inside. 
The boy lies before her. His body is cold and still. The cause of his death is unknown. But as no magic art can revive him, a funeral is held the following day. The boy lies in his casket. His death is a mystery, and the bespectacled girl has vanished without a trace. The wavy-haired girl had wished them both away in a moment of rage, and now it had come to pass. If only she had supported them. If only she'd never loved the boy. If only. If only. If only. As regret clamps its cold fingers around her heart, she whispers four words to whatever god might be listening. Those friends became a family in order to soothe each other's loneliness. But in the end, she's more alone than ever. <sighs> in any case, you're doing great so far! And remember how I said you'll be paid? We'll need to gather Luna fragments to fix the moon, and here's your first one! First one? Look, I appreciate... whatever this is, but... I can't stick around much longer. You should just be thankful Mama's helping you, pal. Now show some freaking respect. Don't threaten the poor child, babe. Also, Yusuke, you may feel differently if we just keep going. TVs. These are the same kinds of TVs we have to... Think, Yuzuki. Remember, this is your own... The scent of books fills the library of an urban high school. A boy's eyes race across the pages of a complicated technical manual. The only sounds are the scrape of his finger across paper and the faint cries of students outside. The library is a place apart. It is his sanctuary, his peace. But not on this day. The chatter of the other students fills the boy with annoyance.
Unable to bear the shattered order of things, the boy closes the book and abandons his study. Casting a scathing glance at the other students, he exits the library without a word. The words and actions of his classmates serve to increase his loneliness, but he is used to it. He walks down the cold and sterile hallway of a hospital, one he has visited times beyond counting. The clinical scent of antiseptic calms his soul. is completely silent, save for the constant beep of an electrocardiogram. The woman in the bed is his mother. And though she is dead to the world, he slowly begins to tidy her room. He replaces the wilted flowers in the vase with a fresh and vibrant bouquet and smells of spring. They are violets, his mother's favorite, and she was delighted to see them when she was admitted. She suffers from a chronic heart condition that sees her constantly in and out of hospitals. He pulls back the curtain letting warm sunlight spill into the room. No, mother, he says as she attempts to sit up. Just rest. Her ex-husband, the boy's father, had pushed the already brittle woman to her breaking point. torn photograph of a family lies discarded on the floor. It shows him with his parents, an older sister, who had gone to live with their father after the divorce. The photo is all that remains of that fleeting moment of happiness. straightening finished, the boy goes to his mother's side. His heart clenches in his chest as he looks down on her grateful expression. His father had beaten his mother more times than he could count. The abuse was so severe his mother could no longer stand. She had provided him with so much happiness when he was a child. He puts all that he can into his studies so he might become a doctor and find a way to cure her. So he now devotes his life to her.
Was that... my past? How in the world? <gasps> you know what? I've got an idea! You know how you managed to restore the past in the Scarecrows? Well, I bet you can use that same trick to change your own past! What? Do you... promise? You bet I do! Well, so long as you manage to fix the moon, that is. <sighs> Fine. I just need to collect more of those Luna fragments, right? You really are such a nice young man, you! Stop it. to collect every last one of those fragments. I knew Mama could count on you! Now come on! So much to do! Huh. My phone's been... updated. Oh my, this is just lovely. Let's take a moment to really breathe in the scenery. Let's not. We need to gather Luna fragments. Hey, bucko. If you talk back to Mama, you're gonna pay. Oh, it's alright, dear. Let's do as he says and hurry on. Why did you stop? Oh dear. That tower is very tall. Please don't tell me you're afraid of heights. And what if she is, pal? Mama's just more suited to lower places than most folks, yeah? <sighs> It, it's nothing, really. Especially since it's for my little you. Just don't take on what you can't handle. It's a dead end. Though, I bet that contraption does something. I bet it does! Let's give it a push. Oh. I would love to know the law of physics that allows that to happen. Well, with the moon broken, who cares if a floor decides to move around a little? <laughs> And 
here we are at the Dark Scarecrow. Let's get down to it, shall we? Does this thing contain the same past as the last one? The one with all the people who use magic? Two girls and a boy once met at a school for children with magical talents. Though they became best friends, trouble arose during an event known as the Day of Pledging. On that day, their star-crossed feelings spiraled out of control and changed their lives forever. The boy perished, and one of the girls vanished. Events that seem to spell the end of the friendship. Near the witch's village, a deep wood lies enshrouded in a thick and heavy mist. Silence hangs on the branches like alien fruit. It is as if the trees themselves are staring at the unexpected visitor in their midst. For at this very moment, the creature, and it, makes its way deeper into the wood. It is nervous, its steps uncomfortable. Finally, the creature arrives at a mirror standing sentinel within the wood. When it sees the image within, it reflexively rejects the vision. For the creature harbors a deep and all-consuming loathing of its own visage. As if attempting to hide the filth it sees, the creature drapes a white sheet over its figure. creature wearing the white cloth. The shadow names the creature before it a werebeast, a thing beyond all comprehension. A smile slithers across the shadow's face, as though no secret can be hidden from its gaze. You wish to be human, yes? The shadow's tone is thick, the words viscous. They worm their way around the heart of the werebeast, poking and prodding with irresistible cruelty. Finally, the werebeast responds in a voice both quaking and resolute. I will do anything to be human. Anything. Looks like it's the past of a beast this time. Yeah, although it sure looked like the same world as last time to me. beast wore a sheet over itself, too. Is that just... a thing in this world? 
Who knew I was such a trendsetter? Ain't nobody a bigger fashionista than my mumsy. I think we're losing the plot here. If only I knew my way around the cage. The road is out. So we'll have to use these routes to get over there. Are you insane? I'll slip and fall and crack my head open like a melon. A melon! Don't worry, Mumsy. I'll protect you with my life or die trying. Uh, you float. You'll be fine. Don't look down, don't look down, don't look down! about your close calls but it looks like it's another dead end oh dear did I mess up the route again maybe this thing will help wait what the did we just Warp? Uh, uh, just as I thought. <laughs> I knew this was the right way. <sighs> Skyscrapers? What's the connection between this place and my world? Oh dear, is my little you homesick? Miss your mama, huh? I feel you, kid. <sighs> Hold on. I've got a bad feeling about these stairs. up and get back to it right I can't die until I find every last fragment Beast arrives at the city that contains the School of Magic. The night is dark, the silence full, yet it is a far different quiet than the still of the wood. The people of the city sleep easily in the protection of their warm homes. 
And as the werebeast takes in the sight, an indescribable feeling begins to well up inside its chest. Perhaps it is envy. Perhaps it is hate. into a dusty window, it sees the shadow staring back. The werebeast does everything that is asked of it, also it might fulfill its own singular desire. Townsfolk's howls of rage shatter the night. The terrified werebeast slips into the dark and makes its way back to the wood. The shadow's smile is ever present as it praises the werebeast's work. But the exhausted werebeast cares not for praise and begs the shadow to finally make it human. The shadow is not finished. Oh no. Instead, it makes one final demand. Before I make you human, you must snuff out the lives of 100 magic users. So the beast needs to kill a hundred magic users in order to make its wish come true. What a simply horrid proposition! This warping is making me dizzy.
was. This thing's in the way. There's no one here. these cells. Is the cage a place where criminals get locked up? Oh, we wouldn't be here if that was true, now would we? <sighs> Someone's here, sis. This is too dangerous. You need to hide. The black birds are talking. These are nasty little creatures that invaded the cage. We'll never get the Luna Fragments if we don't dispatch them. Please, just let my little sister go. <sighs> please, please just don't. Hurt my little sister. <laughs> There's no point in living without my sister. I'm sorry. I just... There was no other way. <clears throat> what are you thinking about, dear? The birds reminded me of how my sister used to look out for me as a kid. Oh, you have a big sister! Is she adorable like you? I... don't know. I have a wonderful idea. Quick, give me your phone. Um, all right. Hey, what are you doing? Well, I was worried about you, so I decided to give your big sister a call. <gasps> Knock it off. I'm sorry, you. I just wanted to cheer you up. <laughs> Afraid I can't let this slide, kid. <sighs> we all make mistakes, yeah? The important thing is putting in the effort to set things right. <sighs> May have been a little harsh back there. Sorry. Oh, it's all right. It's really my fault to begin with. Now, let's keep our heads high and fix the last scarecrow. This is only the third. Oh.
air in the wood hangs strangely ominous. Branches bend, leaves rustle, critical whispers drift sinister on the breeze. They speak of atrocities, of arrogance, but the werebeast pays them no mind as it trundles deeper into the wood. Behind it, a heavy sack leaves a furrow where it drags upon the earth. Inside it is the corpse of a magic user. As the 99th victim falls, the shadow raises its voice in a spasm of utter glee and delight. Animosity and rage seep out from the mirror and coat the werebeast in their violent sheen. When the werebeast awakens from her stupor, a familiar witch stands before her. And for the very first time, she begins to fight against the shadow's unthinkable words. Okay, let's do this! Standing before her is the one she has loved for so, so long. The girl with the wavy hair. The frantic werebeast attempts to string words together, praying they will reach the girl. I will do anything for you. I will be perfect for you. Just please love me. Please. When the voice reaches the girl with the wavy hair, Realization grabs her by the throat. Oh god. Oh my god. This monster. It's my best friend. So that beast was actually the girl with the glasses. What's a telescope doing here? Wait... We used this to look at stars back when I was a kid. We all took turns. And then, I'd always try to show off everything I knew about the stars. Oh, what a lovely memory! We should look at the stars ourselves sometime! I'd rather look at Mama than some dumb ball of hot gas.
finally get that Luna fragment. Let's see how the beast's past ends! In the ruin of a wood, the girl with the wavy hair stands before her best friend, the once bespectacled girl who has now assumed the form of a beast. She has a question that must be asked. Upon hearing the answer, the girl hangs her head low. The cry of the beast and the enmity of the girl swirl together amongst the quaking trees. I can't believe I thought you were my best friend! Why don't you understand? Don't you believe me? I... I hate you! No, 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 no! <sighs> Vanish this world would disappear. The spectacled girl has fully transformed into a creature of pure malice and hate. As her best friend collapses to her knees, she directs a spell at her. With her human heart returned, the girl extends a hand to the one she has always loved. With those words spoken, the girl with the wavy hair plunges her staff into her own chest. The pitiful beast clings to the weathered and clouded mirror, begging for salvation. But the glass remains silent. The only sounds are the wails of the beast as they echo about the wood. There had never been a shadow. The bespectacled girl despaired over an existence where her wish would never come to pass. So she cast a terrible curse upon herself, 
and sought vengeance against the self-same world that denied her. But when the path of her revenge came to its end, she realized that it led to nothing. Best friends, reunited at last. Oh, still, how can people fight if they care so deeply for each other? <sighs> Conflicts can only be avoided if one party decides to endure the pain others inflict on them. That's how it worked in my world, anyway. Oh. Maybe let's save the difficult topics for some other time. Cause right now, it's payday! If I keep going... These TVs... So next, it'll be mine. Facing the past is the responsibility of the one who desires to change it. In the library of a metropolitan high school, a boy diligently attends to his studies. When he visits his mother in the hospital, he remains quiet, speaking only when necessary. She is bedridden as a result of her husband's abuse. The boy has devoted his life to becoming a doctor, so he might save his beloved mother's life. With the day complete, people hurry about their business in the evening gloam of the city. A boy walks alone in the street, surrounded by a noise and light and life that is a far cry from the typical silence of the night. After studying at a cafe, he heads for work. a perfunctory apology and hangs up before the voice on the other end is finished. Suddenly, he bumps into a group of fellow high school students. They chatter and squeak like startled insects, organisms barely worthy of the miracle of life. Deeming the interaction not worth his time, he mutters his second false apology of the evening before hurrying from the scene. He 
was saving up for medical school in the hopes he might somehow restore his mother to health. He studies until words blur across the page and then works multiple jobs to save tuition money. Fatigue is a constant companion, joy an enemy. His life, his seemingly endless life, is nothing but stress. Summoned by his mother's physician, the boy sits quietly in the hospital consultation room. The man opposite slowly begins to speak. He informs the boy that his mother has very little time remaining to her. As if attempting to reject reality, the boy begins peppering the doctor with questions. Doctor explains that his mother's congenital heart condition is worsening by the day. As he delves into the situation in detail, the solution becomes increasingly clear. His mother will need a heart transplant. It is the only thing that might save her. Yet there are many hurdles to overcome, including finding a donor and paying for the procedure. When this cruel reality is finally laid before him, the boy's thoughts dissolve into mist. Why are our lives like this? It is a question he has asked uncountable times. Yet the answer is always the same. It is his father's fault. The man who abused his mother horribly before abandoning them both. And so, this day ends like all the others. With hot rage accumulating in his heart. Like so much ash from a fire. The beeping of the cardiograph serves as proof that his mother yet lives. As she begins to moan softly in her sleep, he reaches out and quietly takes her hand. At this moment, he notices something. His own heart is beating in time with his mother's cardiograph. As realization spreads across his face, he places his free hand over his chest. If it's a heart you need... It's his fault. It's all his fault. anything for my mom. My own life would be a cheap price to pay for hers. Poor you. Oh, things were never easy for you, were they? But if you fix the broken moon, I I'm sure your past will... <sighs> well, I'm going to work extra hard to make that happen so you can finally forget all these terrible things. Thanks. You're helping more than you think. Hmm? What did you say? N nothing.
All right, it's time to go. Follow Mama! Counting on you. But just a little. <laughs> My phone's been updated. It smells like iron. Oh, maybe all that water rusted everything out. A dead end? Oh dear. Did I get lost again? Won't that lever open this gate? Oh! I mean, oh, just as I suspected. Let me open that for you here. Such strength, how dazzling. What huge water wheels! Guess it was the smell of rust after all. Everyone knows iron weakens when it rusts. Someone should have galvanized this. Oh, g gal galvanized? Hey, stop confusing Mama with big words. I didn't mean to. Here we are at the first Dark Scarecrow. Now you just need to, ah. Uh... Repair the past recorded inside and obtain the Luna Fragment. Oh gosh, you're such a quick learner, you. <laughs> and your mama is just so pathetic. In a distant and technologically advanced world, the stage is set for an idol's live performance. This wildly popular, yet enigmatic singer is due to release her newest creation. As she appears before the audience, the first notes of a melody hum through the air. Her powerful voice soars across the crowd.
the people forget their troubles, their worries, and for a moment permit themselves to simply be. The shared euphoria is so great, it seems as if the crowd will lift up and float away. As the girl on stage finishes her performance, she speaks to the rapturous crowd. She begins telling them about all of the emotions she had poured into her new song. But before she can finish, a group of angry men shove their way onto the stage. The girl flinches beneath their sharp gazes as they begin to angrily berate her. What good is music when we are at war, they cry. The men hurl insults in her direction as they move toward her inch by menacing inch. You foolish girl. You simpleton. You have no idea of what's really going on. She does not respond. She cannot. And when they are finally within arm's reach, they lash out in anger. But the idol vanishes. All that remains are a pair of words. Log out. For theirs is an online world that exists in virtual reality. And with no one left to host the event, the concert ends on a note of confusion. Not sure what I was expecting, but it definitely was in a concert from the future. It's the future, but in the past. So weird. Being a pop singer really would be a dream job, <laughs> don't you think? You could be anything you set your mind to, Mumsy. But if you get too popular, who's gonna sing me to sleep? I imagine you could stream your lullabies digitally in that futuristic world. So what were those water wheels? The elevator, maybe? Oh dear, he's in his own little world again. Oh no! Rain! Run, you! I'm surprised it rains in the cage. I know, and it doesn't look like it's going to let up anytime soon. Hmm. It feels like we've come such a long way. I never used to like the sound of the rain, but now. Hmm. Oh, I've got a dilly of an idea. John over here for a sec. What the? You're an umbrella? This should keep you nice and dry as we move. That's my mumsy, a born genius. I 
didn't plan this out very well. I'm going to be soaked to the bone! Yep. Babe, too. Someone's gotta keep Mama nice and warm when the rain makes her cold, yeah? Will that solve the problem, though? I guess I'm the only one who won't get wet. Oh, it's fine! I'm just glad I could help. A mother and son who ride together, dry together. Jealous? <laughs> Whatever you say. This is a country so technologically advanced, it governs itself with an artificial intelligence. Buildings glitter, monitors shine. Every facet of their civilization is a testament to technology. But in one corner of their renowned capital city, a lone girl heaves a heavy sigh. She is the true face behind the singer from the virtual concert. Her life has been locked in a holding pattern since the unfortunate events at her last show. Everywhere she looks, she sees armed guards, security drones, cameras. Her country has been at war for many years now. The smiles of its people are dim and dismal things. Only the artificial lights carry any brilliance now. War, and the changes it has wrought, have stolen both the people's smiles and their happiness. Eventually, the girl comes across people arguing. Soldiers forcefully pull along a citizen who is protesting the recent military draft. Conflict with other countries has now created fierce disputes within their own borders. With a gun turned on them, the citizen finally falls in line. It is a sad sight, and the girl finds herself much upset to see such weakness. We are all human, she thinks. Yet, we cannot stop fighting. of the war plays endlessly on the feeds, driving the people near to madness with worry. 
The girl had begun singing in an attempt to restore some small bit of joy to her fellow citizens' lives. But now, all she can think about are the angry screams directed at her during the last show. They haunt her dreams, steal her sleep, and cause her to ask one question again and again. Is there even a point to anything I've done? War, surveillance, a military draft. Signs may advance, but humans never do. That girl is trying her best, but no one has room in their heart. Guess we're finally out of the rain. A fork in the road. Which way should we go? Considering the previous routes, I'd say the left path is the one we want. Once you get the next Luna Fragment, it's goodbye for you and me. Really? Yep. Oh, did I forget to mention that? See, you need three Luna Fragments in total to fix the moon, so... Yep, almost done. Tokyo Tower is in the cage? And there are other buildings, too. Does this mean we're getting close to my world? I think so. There are more moons now, after all. More moons? What are you talking about? Oh, uh, never mind. Ignore me. <gasps> you should try putting your hand up to that bird statue. Should take us where we need to go. Ugh, my head is spinning. again. Giant towers, warping machines, who developed all this technology? Eh, probably the gods. Uh, I suppose I have no way to deny that. Back where we started.
left is this little wingding. Never thought I'd get used to warping. Scarecrow. The girl is racked with indecision. She knows the people are exhausted of endless war, yet she is unsure if she should sing again. She began doing so in order to restore some small bit of happiness to their lives. But some people became enraged that she might dare to do such a thing in a time of war. This dark shadow has now crawled inside her thoughts and taken up residence as a most unwelcome guest. There's no point in making music if it just ends up hurting people. So where did it all go wrong? And what's the right thing to do? The power of her prayers has brought her this far. But now, even those have grown muddied and dark casting a gloom over her once brilliant face. Her head droops, her eyes fade. But then, she receives a notification. She opens her inbox. In it, she finds messages beyond counting. Many are words of encouragement for her actions. Some are critiques, some threats. But among them all, one in particular stands out. A message of thanks from a former soldier. Though he is no longer able to fight, he says her music encourages him to keep helping however he can. Silent tears appear in the corners of her eyes. As she reads the messages, she is reminded of a sensation, an emotion, 
long thought lost. And she realizes then and there what truly matters. go just be careful you know what will happen if you keep causing problems oh yes uh, thank you I mean I'm uh, I'm sorry <sighs> calm down mumsy oh there they are I hope we don't have to have this conversation again farewell then Goodness me, you're back. Terribly sorry about all that. Who are you talking to? Her? Oh, she's just sort of my boss, I guess. But don't worry about it, you. You seem down. Are you all right? Oh, I'm fine. wasn't it? What the? Whoopsie. <laughs> I spooked myself back to normal. No need to worry, Mama. I'll keep your tummy nice and warm. Oh, why can't I ever get a break? Sorry, you, but it looks like I'm out of magic. I can't turn into an umbrella anymore. Oh. There are lots of tall buildings all around, so it's unlikely lightning would strike us. You're so calm! What the hell happened? Where'd they go? Uh. Are you okay? She went too far. At this rate, she's gonna... <sighs> it's okay. I'll give myself up for her. Hey, what are you... You get me. You'd do the same. Huh? What happened? Are you alright, Mama? Fiddle, you silly Billy. And I'm glad to see you're okay. But babe, he... Oh, he's fast asleep. <gasps> Poor little fella must be exhausted. Oh, that's... that's good. 
I think I got too carried away there. Don't do that again. Anywho, I'm fine now. It's time for you to restore the past in the final Dark Scarecrow. Right. A melody of prayer echoes through the midnight city. Then come voices criticizing the girl once more. Music envelops the city like an ocean squall. People watch the video of the girl. Her powerful, yet delicate voice absorbed in song. And then, a secret, formless light begins to shine. The girl, now present, walks through the city to witness it for herself up close. Singing the same notes that swirl and tumble in the gaps between buildings. She sees people cheering for her holograms, and others jeering with equal fervor. Once again, her actions bring out the fiercest of reactions from all who see her. But she no longer doubts herself. The idol of light believes in the power of music and uses it to convey her will to all who hear it. She once made a vow to the people of her land. She promised to wipe away their tears and stay close to those with heavy hearts. And I will keep singing, because I Such profound kindness. All she wanted to do was heal others with her music. She's burdened by the weight of emotions I can't even imagine. I'm just glad this last memory wasn't as horrible as all the others. Hmm. Either way, well done on finishing your job. Now let's get you paid.
So this is the final Luna Fragment. Let's keep going so you can repair the moon! This path makes me nervous. It's all right, you. I'm right behind you. What are these? Recordings of some kind? <sighs> Shut up. Shut up. Stop talking in my head. Easy there, you! This is just proof that we're nearing your world! The broken moon is becoming whole again! Any wish that comes true comes with a price. That is an unavoidable truth. The boy does nothing but study and work. Study and work. Study and work. The stress of his routine weighs on him. It is a burden he should not have to bear. The physician told him how much time his mother had left, as well as how they might save her. And so, he finally arrives at a great decision. One taken to preserve his tiny sliver of happiness. The boy walks through an endless night with no exit. He does not question where he is. His only aim is to follow the moon that now hangs in a darkened sky. close to death. He knows this. It is the only memory he has left. And knowing the end is close, he attempts to reach out to everyone he comes across. But he receives only cruelty in return. Sensing he has no place to call his own in this life, his legs slowly grind to a halt.
remembers what he and his mother said to one another when he was young. Even when his father scolded him, even when he fought with his sister, his mother had always been on his side. Once again, he begins to walk. The moon shimmers, illuminating the path. It is his guide, a lamp in the darkness, so he might save his mother who now hovers between life and death. up on the couch. The room is dim, the curtains drawn. The only sound is the dull hum of a refrigerator. Bottles of drugs sit on the table before him. It is poison he purchased on shady websites. Poison enough to kill him many times over. But it is also a release. For while it causes brain death, it will leave his heart intact for his mother. Yet his body is not eager to embrace this plan. And for a while, he had lost consciousness. Words of self-defense flutter in and out of his mind. But knowing that his mother has no time left, he manages to shove them aside. His rational mind suppresses his will to survive, and he brings the drugs to his mouth. He feels as though his final moments will last into eternity. But then his phone rings. He lacks the mindfulness to notice his palpitating heart. But somehow, he manages to trace a shaking finger across the screen. The call that saved his life was from the hospital where his mother is admitted. It is as though time is frozen in the hospital room. The light filtering in through the window bathes his mother's gaunt features in an ethereal pallor. She had passed not long before, quickly and without warning. There is a thin smile on her face, as though free at last from her hell. The boy attempts to muffle his sobs, trying not to give voice to the wail that threatens to consume him. He has lost his last remaining beam of moonlight. And now, he can only hold tight to the shell of what used to be his mother.
If only he was never here. If only... I lived only for my mother's sake. I always sucked it up and worked harder than anyone else I knew. And yet... God damn it! Oh, Yusuke. Well, let's keep going. Once you fix the moon, I'm sure your past will... It's time for our journey to come to its end. <sighs> I know. I'll do what I came here to do. Well, this is our last stop. It's the place in the cage closest to the moon. And it's also the place closest to your world. I'm so glad you were around to help me like you did, you. Thank you. No. <sighs> I've never seen the moon look so big. Come here, you! You'll find the altar of the moon at the top of these stairs. Offer up the Luna fragments to it, and it'll put the moon back together. Uh, I think. Our journey felt so long, but so short at the same time. <laughs> Guess that's a bit cliched, huh? Oh, you've got a good head on you, so no matter what happens in your world, you'll be fine. Go on, then. Shake a leg already. I, uh, I had fun traveling with you, I mean. Oh, Yuzuki, are you blushing? I heard that, kid. Decided to be honest for once, huh? Ah, uh, you guys. This is your last big job. No turning back now. I know. I'm going.
Yuki, how do you want to change your past? I want this. Leaving school, and then... Huh? Hello? Hina? Who is this? And how do you know my name? No time for that now, kiddo. I'll tell you where to go. So just follow my instructions. Okay... Um... Where am I? This is a place called the Cage. Just keep going down that path for now. with this room see those two doors on the far side there head for the white one the white door right through. <laughs> it's so bright. Take a good look at the sun in the sky there. Do you see it? The sun in this world is broken. What do you mean? You can't just break a sun. And wait, this isn't Tokyo, is it? I actually have a favor to... Huh? You there? He hung up on me. <sighs> I... 
Guess I'll head this way. Gadgets. Never could get the hang of them. What are you? How are you floating? Are you the one who called me? Well, if it isn't Hina, glad to see you made it in one piece. You can call me Papa. I'll show you the way through here, so come on. What's going on here? Who are you? And where am I? I just woke up here and don't know what's happening. How do I get home? I get that you're anxious, but just stay calm, okay? Elevator? Sure is. Hop on and I'll fill you in. It's so dark. I guess it's nighttime here. The time of day and the weather change, depending on where you are in the cage. So, I've told you all there is to know at this point. You get what you need to do here, right? Uh, I think so. Basically, I need to repair the past, then repair the broken sun. And when that's done, I can go home. Right? Smart kid. And yep, you'll find out soon enough. This cage looks like something I'd find in a history textbook. I don't even know what kind of history this building has. Here's our first dark scarecrow. Time to get to work. Okay. So what should I do? Huh? What the? In this country, science has advanced to the point where artificial intelligence rules over the populace. As a war raged, one girl sang to bring energy and joy back to the people. Some disagreed with her actions, thinking them inappropriate for wartime. However, she held firm her beliefs and resolved to continue singing. But then... On that very same day, she meets another girl. Dust and gunpowder swirl among the city ruins. The smell of fried circuitry hangs heavy in the air. This place was once home to humans. Now it is home to soldiers who await their opportunity to strike. 
Standing beside them is a lone girl who looks very much out of place. On her signal, the soldiers load their weapons with armor-piercing bullets. And as she issues a second signal, a flash envelops the entire area. This is followed by a hailstorm of bullets. Flames erupt from muzzles, tearing apart what remains of the ruins. The girl boldly steps into the crossfire. But she is unharmed. For she is not flesh and blood, but a hologram. Confirming the enemy soldiers' positions, she discloses their locations to her allies. The strategy works with stunning efficiency. The day is won thanks to the decisiveness of the AI that oversees the country. And with the battle over, the simulated head of state proposes a new tactic. Place mines under enemy corpses. It is a ruthless plan. One that seeks to blunt the effectiveness of any reinforcements. But the people accept her brutality, for they know she will sacrifice anything in pursuit of perfection. And that she does so for their sake. just saw was a past that's been recorded inside Mr. Scarecrow there. Now let's keep it up and fix more of them. The road's broken. What do we do? Sorry, kiddo, but this is the only way. Think you can jump it? Give it a shot. I hope I can get home okay. We have to break through this black barrier. These are some big water wheels. Okay, this is dark. Very dark. I'll take care of that. And... Surprise! Your old man really lights up the room when he walks in, eh? That's... one way of putting it. Ouch. Cold. Anywho, I'll just lead the way. We're not going to find ghosts or anything, are we? Looks like we can keep going through here. What a relief. Well, well. 
We finally found our second scarecrow. Having completed their objective, the AI returns to the city with her soldiers. Just then, several reports come in. The AI has her hands full with the business of governance. Her gaze grows as cold as the air around her. The man attempts to apologize for his indiscretion, but it is too late. She hates nothing more than the word incomplete, and does not attempt to hide her disdain. If you ever say that word to me again, it will be the last one you utter. You cannot run from me. You cannot hide. I will destroy you with a thought. Now stop wasting my time. Terrified by the rage in her eyes, the man crumples to the ground. With a dismissive click of the tongue, she sets off again. In her task to govern the nation, the girl seeks perfection and loathes incompleteness. Perhaps because it reminds her of herself. For she understands a key element was left out during her creation. And she will do anything to obtain it. She will do anything to be complete. Black was really angry, huh? Don't see why. Heck, none of us are truly complete, you know? <sighs> Actually, I can kind of understand wanting to be perfect. Well, everybody sees things differently. Guess I can put this light out now. Oh! 
And the jellyfish are flying? How? Looks like they won't attack us. You're not afraid, are you? I mean, maybe a little. But they're so pretty. Oh. I really am in another world, huh? It feels like we're in the ocean. Hmm. This reminds me of the aquarium my family went to once when I was a kid. There were so many jellyfish. They glowed like little jewels. Well, I'll do my best to guide you so we can make wonderful memories of our own. Thanks. Voices play in the girl's mind. They are conversations held by researchers before she woke. Conversations burned in her memory. Every time she recalls their words, an inky blackness fills her heart. They lament the failure of Unit 1, her predecessor. And having determined the cause of her failure, they decide to remove it from Unit 2. search for completeness and perfection, the researchers created an imperfect being. The voices warp, harming her mind. I must be perfect. Her own desire has now become a curse. Unit 2 lacks what caused Unit 1 to fail. She does not have a right eye, nor the functions that come with it. And though she may desire completeness, the false eye in her socket is useless. But Unit 1 had been complete, so what did she see? What did her right eye show her? I can't see anything. I have no answers. All I know is that I am incomplete. Her false eye only serves as proof of her deficiency. A commotion in the city draws the AI back to reality. Delighted people watch the girl in white. 
When the AI sees her, her body shudders with a mix of shock and rapture. For the girl before her is Unit One. She who holds the secret to making the AI complete. the end? The one singing? I feel like I know her somehow. I told you this already. But the sun can grant wishes. What you think? Any wishes you want granted? Hmm. Let's see. I'd wish for... To be super rich, I guess. Sounds like you don't believe it can actually happen. Here's our fourth Dark Scarecrow. I wonder what's gonna happen to that girl in black. arrives in a digital world. It is the true home for AIs like herself. The girl believes Unit 1 must be here, and she sets out in search of her. Unit 1 was said to have been deactivated after making a grave error. And yet she lives on singing songs of peace under a new name and appearance. The girl cannot comprehend the actions of her predecessor. She wonders if this is because she is incomplete. I finally found you, says the girl in black. In response, Unit 1 turns to face her. The girl in white stares at her counterpart. Confused. The other AI readies her weapon and makes clear her desire. I will take your right eye. I will finally be complete.
A crooked smile crosses the face of the girl in black. The object of her obsession is so close now. The other girl struggles as she moves her hand closer to her eye. Closer. Closer. And then, with great strength, she rips it free. She places the stolen eye in her own empty socket. Her mind shatters. Thoughts of her past atrocities race through her, followed by a tidal wave of guilt and regret. For the thing the girl in black lacked, which she now had, was a conscience. Warnings flood her memory banks. Her senses collapse, and she vanishes. The silence of the virtual space is perfect. The girl in white touches a terminal and goes to see what has become of the outside world. Having lost its ruling AI during wartime, the country's end came within months. The girl in white wanted to atone for her mistakes by giving the people song and prayer. She wanted... With her conscience stolen away, the girl is now a hollow shell. Her question rises up and vanishes on the wind, whispering endlessly through a graveyard of empty buildings. Both girls did everything they could for their people. But not even an advanced AI can predict its own fate. <laughs> anyway, you did good. You're a real trooper. Now here's that paycheck you've been waiting for. A soul fragment. A fragment? I finally got one. But just one's not enough to get me home, is it? I know you're anxious, but we just need to keep moving ahead. These TVs look a lot like the one I have at... <laughs> Do you really think it's just a coincidence? Come on, try to remember.
In a metropolitan high school, the windows have been flung wide to welcome the early summer breeze. The chatter of students eager to head home fills the halls. A girl emerges from a classroom. Her friend has been asking for this particular favor for the entire school year. All right, says the girl, but you owe me a soda. Her teacher's confidence in her ability could not be more clear. I'll do my best, responds the girl, giving her teacher a polite smile that fails to reach the eyes. She deftly turns down the invitation with a promise to go later and rushes for the school gates. To all eyes, the girl is a sociable, clever student who openly embraces all the joys youth has to offer. The girl makes her way down a quiet residential street, away from the chaos and clatter of the city. She hurries home with quick and silent steps. I'm home. She calls out in a relieved voice after stepping through the door. Said home is a meager, unfortunate apartment, a far cry from the halcyon image of her school life. The girl finds her father sitting listlessly in a room barely large enough for two. She begins to buzz about the space straightening and cleaning without the slightest hint of resentment. Perched casually atop the TV is a bank book that represents their entire life as father and daughter. The remaining balance is less than some of her friends' allowances. But she manages to make ends meet by working part-time. She carefully picks a rumpled suit off the floor and places it neatly on a hanger. When did he last wear this? She wonders to herself. He has been unemployed ever since he and her mother divorced. She finds a family photo fallen from one of the gaps between books. It shows her with her parents and little brother, who had gone to live with their mother after the divorce. 
It shows a time when happiness was not yet a fiction. And after a moment, she crushes it in her fist. The room tidied, the girl alights on a cushion and takes a small rest. Her father's speech is dull, flat. It sounds like the final puff of air released from a corpse. His ex-wife's wasteful spending had saddled him with impossible debts. Emotionally and spiritually broken, her father's daily life had become a thing of rote and sorrow. But it had not always been so. The man once provided his little girl with all the joy imaginable. So no matter how hard their life might be, she would continue to smile for his sake. Dad. wasn't easy with your pops. But if you wish for it, you should be able to rewrite your past. <laughs> Life never changed for me, no matter what I did. Do you really think I can rewrite the past? Sure I do. Well, if you manage to fix the sun, that is. I'll go with you and collect the rest of the soul fragments. <laughs> I knew you'd be up to the task! Get all the fragments. I'll... Yes, sirree. Then I'll do my part, too. Hey, my phone updated. It's so dry. Talk about your sudden changes in climate. Try not to get sick now. And if you need some shut-eye, I'm always happy to be your pill. I'm good.
dead end? Go on and give that thingamajig a smack. Tonight, I weave for you the tale of a kingdom wreathed by sea and sand. A tale of missed connections spanning many nights. Desire is a thing fiercer than any sandstorm. The rich scent of spices and the murmur of crowds drift on the air throughout the city. Ships from across the seven seas gather here, making the kingdom the pinnacle of trade. On this day, a sailor known far and wide for his shrewd mind arrives in the harbor. He seeks to answer the notice issued by the queen. My beautiful princess no longer smiles. Any man who returns her joy may have her. Spurred by the challenge, the man quickens his pace. He dreams of the beautiful wife who awaits him in the lavish palace. The man decorates himself in riches most bountiful. His confidence grows with each step he takes toward the palace. He knows the princess will soon be his. Suddenly, a ragged boy appears before him. He pulls out a dagger and waves it menacingly. The man had been so sure of his victory. Yet there he lays stripped of his fine belongings. Having assumed the sailor's guise, this boy now plays the main role in our tale. After briefly pitying the man, the boy leaves him behind and makes his way for the palace. The boy earns a living as a thief. What he wants, he takes. This is the guiding principle of his life. And he has taken not only the sailor's finery this day, but also his mission to see the princess smile and claim her kingdom as his own.
the bustling crowds of the city grow distant. The palace appears, filled with naught but the quiet trickling of fountains. It is a most resplendent place, the nexus of all the kingdom's riches. And sitting in the center of the courtyard, clad in pure white dress, is its greatest treasure. The princess is completely motionless, like a doll on display. The thief ignores the queen. Instead, he begins to spin a nonsensical tale of adventure, one created in the moment. Today, princess, I shall tell you of a pitiful djinn I once met on an adventure. The djinn had spent centuries in perfect stillness. He thought of nothing but freedom, thought so hard on it, in fact, that his beard turned to stone. Seeing he could not move, I lifted my trusty torch high and set his beard ablaze. In his delight, he scooped me up in his arms, and we soared to freedom together. As the thief ends his story, he peers at the princess and awaits her reaction. Behind her veil, he sees a face both beautiful and despondent. But there is not a hint of a smile. As her guards move to surround him, the thief speaks to her. Silence returns to the palace. But the thief's emotions reached no one and vanished within the sands. Looks like we'll be learning about some kid from the desert this time. That desert palace was so pretty. If I fix this past, I'll get another soul fragment. a long time ago. Uh, Hina, let's not... There was a magic lamp, and a flying carpet, and... Sounds like a real great flick. But don't say any more, or I'll get sued. Huh? If you want, old Papa can point out his favorite bathing area. Oh, that's terrifying. Pass.
Don't be so selfish. What do we have here? A talking bird? I hate you! This... Hey, where are you going? Oh no, they're fighting. Who are you people? Who? Us? We're nice. No stranger danger here. Was the bird that flew away your little sister? Yes. We had a fight. So, um, would you like us to help you find her? Do you mean it? Thank you. That's very kind of you. Oh my. You gotta give that what's it there the business if you wanna keep going forward. Uh, so dizzy. I see. So. That is a warp. Why are there buildings over there? Another dead end? Oh ho! Take a closer look. I'm thinking we can get across if we lower the bridge. Shall I fly over and take a look? Please! I do it myself, but my poor back isn't what it used to be. <laughs> You're just lazy. Please, be careful. Don't worry. If I just follow these girders... Huh? here. Maybe the cage is still under construction? I'm glad you made it across. Me too. You did good, little bird. Go to work, Hina. Take care in there. Huh. 
How many times has the sun risen and fallen since Thief and Princess first met? How many times has he ventured into the palace to spin for her another tale of his exploits? One day, he tells of an instrument which speaks. Another day, a spring of gold within a jar. But no matter the tale, and no matter how skillful the telling, the princess never smiles. And then, one day, the princess remains as emotionless as always. Yet as the thief turns to leave, she slowly approaches him. Her voice is delicate silk, her words hesitant. The thief's heart leaps when he hears her speak for the first time. Before he leaves, he swears to her this, I shall make you smile on the morrow. His first visit to the palace had been for devilish reasons. But after many days and nights, he now finds himself genuinely wishing to see the princess smile. This is most unlike me, he laughs at himself as he heads back into the city. After leaving the palace, he steals an apple from the market to fill his empty stomach. As he sets off for home, his gaze turns to the starry night sky above. When he reaches a puddle, he halts and stares at the reflection of the majesty above him. It contains unfathomable depths, as though a hole has fallen open in the very world itself. Though disturbed by the vanished puddle, the thief walks on. fortune teller calls to him from a stall blanketed in a black canopy. She is dressed in a mystical manner, almost as if clad in night itself. The crystal ball on the table shimmers like the stars. As she raises her hands to the orb, a look of concern settles over her face. Death awaits if you continue to see the princess. The thief bursts out laughing at the fortune. A future is something I take for myself. He is a thief. He has spent his whole life stealing whatever he likes. Money, food, even lives. And why does he want the princess's smile? Because a future was once stolen from him. For you see, 
there was once a smile he was unable to reclaim. me. It was broken, so I fixed it. You've been a huge help so far. Thank you. Still, is that boy really going to die if he keeps seeing the princess? Hey, even fortune tellers get it wrong sometimes. I bet he's fine. Yeah. about my sister. It's okay. We'll find her. someplace. I hope they're okay. <sighs> What's up there, kiddo? My brother and I used to fight over snacks when we were kids. He'd set up these traps around them so he wouldn't have to share. Is that a nice memory? I'm not sure.
You sure you didn't want to answer that? Could it be? You don't look so hot, kiddo. Maybe you ought to take the rest of the day off. I'll be fine. This is a tale of when the boy thief did not yet know his way of life. A trade ship groans under stacks of cargo. That it even floats is a small miracle. The boy is a slave, his treatment as harsh and unrelenting as the heat in summer. Seeing no end to his misery, he thinks himself unlucky to have ever drawn breath. His only solace is a slave girl aboard the same ship. The girl's clothes have been discarded along with the garbage. Her smile holds the power to part the darkest clouds. It has pulled the boy free from his despair uncountable times. Old books lie scattered across the deck. The girl had read to him the adventures in their pages, granting him courage. But now, she smiles no longer. It has fled along with her joy. The boy comes to a decision. He will save the slave girl. He will bring her smile back. The ship drifts on the wind from one continent to the next. Fighting against the turbulent waves, the boy runs to the bow of the ship. This man does not think of his slaves as people and his treatment is both cruel and unjust. He is the reason she no longer smiles. Though fear races through the boy's heart, he finds his courage all the same. The captain mocks the boy with a grin. A surge of emotion pushes the boy forward. He plunges a hidden blade into the captain, killing him instantly. The boy does not know a life outside of slavery. It is his world, his all, his everything. But he has done this to protect the girl's smile. He speaks gently to the wounded girl, telling her they are now free. Alas, her spirit has shattered under the abuse and can never be made whole. She will never smile again.
the boy learns an important lesson that day. What is stolen can never be reclaimed. And so he arrives at a decision. He will join the side of the takers, so nothing can ever be stolen from him again. The princess in the palace reminds the thief so much of the girl. He is trying to return the smile which was lost all those many years ago. And so he tells her wild tales of adventure, just as the girl once did for him. When he finally finishes his tale, the princess approaches him. Take me from this place, she whispers. I will, he says, tonight. He and the princess have exchanged a secret promise. After countless visits, she has finally opened her heart to him. But the question remains. Can he return her smile? I kind of wish someone would steal me away from a palace in the middle of the night. Hey, old Papa will sneak into your home and whisk you away whenever. That's how people get arrested. I could swear we were the only folks in this part of the cage. Then what exactly did I just see? You really miss your little bro, don't you? Yeah. I do. I want to see him. No. I have to see him. Crow. Those gears. We'd be flat as a pancake if one of them fell on us. Can you not jinx us, please? Well, I 
let's see how our little thief story ends. And then we'll get another soul fragment. A secret garden lies deep in this land of luxury. It is far out of reach, like the brilliant moon which hangs heavy in the dark. Or it should be, but this night, the thief has snuck through the garden and toward the princess's room. He is here to hold fast to his promise. He is here to whisk her away. As the princess awaits her salvation, he pulls her into a tight embrace. Together, they steal away into the night. The pair run through the darkness of the midnight city. The warm lights of the palace are small and distant things. As the houses become more sparse, the smell of the sea grows stronger. Hope blossoms in the thief's heart as he feels the princess breathe. He forges onward so they might leave this kingdom and find her smile anew. Stars twinkle above the quiet bay as though blessing them. The small boat the thief prepared beforehand bobs gently on the water. The thief does as his heart bids him. He says, because I wish to see you smile. As he speaks, her lips turn upward. The moonlight illuminating her white veil makes it difficult to see her face. But he knows he has found her smile at last. Suddenly, guards clad in black appear. The thief produces his blade. He will not permit them to interfere with their voyage. The poison coating the enemy weapons attempts to steal his consciousness. His body collects wound after wound as he cuts down the guards. But who should then appear but the fortune teller, the selfsame one he met all those nights ago. Kill him, she commands. The thief has no strength left to ponder this new development. I will not permit any to steal her smile, he cries in a hoarse and raspy voice. The thief finds himself slowly slipping away. The princess calls to him. He reaches out, but his hands encounter only darkness. His mind still cloudy, 
The thief's eyes peel open. The water is calm, reflecting the glow of sunrise in its perfect mirror. The thief looks around, wondering if he has finally obtained freedom with the princess. But he finds only the fortune teller, the same one who had foretold his death. He is still unable to grasp what is happening, even as she thrusts her spear through him. His eyes bore into her, ablaze with hate. Her laughter intermingles with the sound of waves. His roar is accompanied by the flash of a blade. Entangled like lovers, they vanish into the depths. Was I able to return her smile? The fortune teller's laugh envelops the thief's entire being. It covers his thoughts in darkness until the end. That boy spent all his days taking things from other people. That sort of thing always comes with a price. And yet, people can't stop doing it. <sighs> well, let's set aside the deep philosophy for now. Nice job, kiddo. puts me one step closer to repairing the sun. means this time it's <laughs> if you seek to change the past then you must pay the price the girl a student at a metropolitan high school walks the halls with a bright and cheerful smile. But hidden behind that brilliance is the truth of the unhappy life she lives with her father. The debt accumulated by her mother caused immense mental and emotional pressure on her father. But she continues to wear a smile for his sake. With the day complete, people hurry about their business in the evening gloom of the city. The girl walks alone on the street, bathed in the warm glow of brilliant neon. Her hood has been pulled down over her eyes, as if attempting to hide a grim truth. When a message comes to her phone, she glances down before typing a simple reply. Almost there. Urged on by her client, she picks up her pace.
The lights of the city fade as the girl enters the malignant gloom of a dingy alleyway. While the city is bright and vibrant, here darkness reigns. A young man of college age stands amidst the shadows. Seeing her approach, his face breaks out into a lean and hungry grin. She takes his money and hands him a small bag in return. A bag containing illegal drugs. This is her secret. The profession she has assumed so she might repay her family's massive debt. As the student continues mumbling, she spins on one heel and begins her retreat. Guilt, that old, familiar friend, rises in her chest. Guilt over abetting the destruction of another life. Enough. This is for Dad. Nothing else matters. Suddenly, a knife appears, as if conjured from the dark. Fearing what the man might do, the girl dashes away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She weaves and bobs through the crowd of people, drying tears on her sleeves as she runs. Suddenly, a collision. An impact. Pain. All she wants, all she has ever wanted, is to live a quiet life with her father. She has risked everything for this one small wish. But in this world, the people who pass by on the street care nothing for her. The dim fluorescent light barely illuminates the room. I'm home, cries the girl as she forces a false cheer into her voice. Her father's empty eyes gaze into a blank television. Pressing on, she sits down and begins excitedly telling him about her day at school. Eventually, she gets around to the biggest news, a list of jobs at fine companies that her homeroom teacher had encouraged her to pursue. Convinced this news will lift her father's spirits, she is shocked to see him crumple into himself and begin to wail uncontrollably. As he sobs, he speaks of the shame he feels in being unable to provide his daughter with the higher education she deserves. As she calls out to her unstable father, her true feelings burst to the surface.
Why, Dad? Why are our lives like this? It is a question she has asked uncountable times, yet the answer is always the same. It is her mother's fault. The woman who took everything from them and left nothing but crushing debt in return. And so this day ends like all the others, with cold rage accumulating in her heart like so much snow in a blizzard. It's his fault. It's all his fault. I would do anything for my dad. It was my only choice, even though I knew it was wrong. Things were pretty tough for you, huh, kiddo? But once you fix the broken son, I bet your past will... <sighs> oh, come on now. No need for the waterworks. Here, just snuggle up to Papa and wipe those tears away. I'd rather use the sand. Hot pot of coffee. You really hate old Papa that much? <laughs> I was kidding. Right then. Let's get the lead out. All right. I'll do my absolute best to guide you so we can get that smile of yours back to normal. Thank you. My phone's been updated again. So the last soul fragment is in this part of the cage, huh? Which brings our little road trip to an end. Kind of brings a tear to your eye. Uh, yeah. Real sad. You're not 
not even pretending to be sad. Scarecrow. Time to go to work. Restore the past recorded inside, and you'll get your fragment. The Scarecrow looks... familiar. Tonight, I weave for you the tale of a kingdom wreathed by sea and sand. The heroine of our story is a charming princess who seeks true love for herself. Ruling over both sea and desert, this kingdom thrives in trade. And its queen has issued a notice. My beautiful princess no longer smiles. Any man who returns her joy may have her. The men in the courtyard queue in place, waiting to claim the princess for themselves. The first hopeful begins to speak. But his words do not reach her. She does not smile. The men's words are hollow things. They tell the princess they see her only for her station. But that error is not theirs alone. Indeed, all who live in the kingdom are blind. They cannot see the princess for who she truly is. With her face a stone, the men surrender and return to their homes. No one understands me, she sighs. But then, a lone boy dressed as a sailor appears before her one barely on the cusp of manhood. He makes no mark on her, for today she has seen more strange men than there are stars in the sky. The boy begins to spin a tale of wild adventure. He speaks of a djinn he met on a journey. He speaks of desert islands filled with wonders of seas so vast their edges have never been found. The princess is enraptured by his tale. She stares at him from behind her veil, saying not a word. On the queen's signal, the boy is escorted away. His voice grows distant, and silence soon returns to the palace.
As the princess ponders this development, another uninvited guest comes to see her. The dark of night falls over the palace as the princess rushes through its halls. The fantastical palace in which she lives is in truth a prison that has stolen her freedoms. The words she uses, the way she acts, even the order in which she eats her food. Every aspect of her life had been decided from the day of her birth. No one has ever seen the true me. None of the men, and not even that boy. Day after day, she plays the role of a demure princess. Unable to bear this curse, she eventually lost the will to smile. Her bedroom is adorned with the most elegant and fanciful decorations. It is one of the few places she can find peace. At a signal from her lady-in-waiting, the princess changes her clothes. The moon once again emerges from behind the clouds. She stares at herself in the mirror, dressed now in the guise of a fortune teller. It is a persona she assumes only when the sun takes its leave from the sky. She orders her lady-in-waiting to keep watch, then slips from the palace without a sound. She will be greeted by the bustle of a city bathed in danger and vice. And it is there that she will slip the pent-up frustrations of her carefully orchestrated life. Good job there, kiddo. I knew this scarecrow looked familiar. It's the princess from the last past I visited. Say, what were you doing on your phone? Uh, just playing one of those mobile games. You play while I work. Cool. There's not much room to walk here. Is that an earthquake? Hmm. Try not to look down, all right? Please don't say things that'll make me want to look. The 
princess in that past we just saw had such a fancy room. Canopy bed, too. I've always wanted to sleep in one of those. You ever wish you could be a princess, Hina? Oh, you know, maybe a little. Although, I'd be happy to just have a normal life with my family. Happiness comes in many forms, and that sounds like one of them to me. Yeah. Floor gave way, and then... Wait... Where's Papa? <sighs> Guess I have to keep going. Every night, the princess slips out of the palace for her own amusement. She sits in a dim and dingy alleyway, one that lies forgotten by the people of the city. This small tent is the princess's second home. It is a place where she tells fortunes one of her own creation. Yet her divinations often ring true, and rumors claim her words can change fate itself. She waves her hands over a crystal ball for her first couple of the night. Even as a child, the princess possessed a gift for fortunes. She sees the couple's fate in the crystal ball and prepares to speak it aloud. The light within the ball grows faint and vanishes. With an exaggerated inflection, she speaks. Your man is unfaithful. He spends his free nights prowling the city for new partners. Betrayed, the woman rushes away in tears. 
princess's divinations often tear seemingly happy couples apart. Whenever this occurs, she feels her melancholy ease. When she assumes the guise of the fortune teller, none realize she is the princess. This only confirms her suspicion that no one sees her for who she truly is. Not a soul within the palace, nor a soul without. Another vision flickers to life in her crystal. She sees strangers peering into her world. The princess quickly recovers from the unexpected occurrence and informs the couple of the result. It is a dangerous game to toy with the heart of another. But be it as fortune teller or princess, the woman knows salvation will never come for her. Alas, her life proceeds on a path that is set by another. As the princess sits deep in thought, a familiar boy passes before her tent. It is the sailor, the selfsame one who came to the palace spinning tales of adventure. Perhaps he sees the real me. She decides to test his motives. She forecasts his grim end with these words. Death awaits if you continue to see the princess. But then... The boy bursts into loud, innocent laughter. She watches him as he vanishes into the thick of the crowd. I wonder if he will come to the palace tomorrow, she thinks to herself. And as she slowly makes her way home, she finds her steps to be lighter than usual. That should do it. Seems like you finished the job. Now keep on going. By the way, how did you even know my contact info? Oh, you know, I sort of... <laughs> uh, okay. Sure. See there? Take that road, then turn that away. 
You could be a little more specific. A bird statue? Give it a tap. See what's what. I think it warped me. Well, don't that beat all. I can't see your coordinates on the map anymore. Uh, what? Oh, never mind me. Just keep on trucking. <sighs> the flowers are glowing. It's really pretty here, but also kind of lonely. Is this my brother's notebook? It's the one he used in elementary school. He was always writing stuff down, like ideas for pranks. Oh wow, this is Dad's mug. My brother and I saved up to buy this for him. I wonder if someone used to live here. So beautiful. What kind of flowers are these? What's my hair clip doing here? My brother laughed and told me it looked terrible, so I never wore it. There's a door over there. Maybe you can get out of there. Let me take a look. This door won't open. Well, that's strength. The only way forward. Well, this ain't good. Exception putting up. Hello? You there? Oh, just stay there, Hina. Oh, no. What should I do? Hope nobody minds if I rest here for a bit. Guess I'll have a seat. Hmm. Been a while 
since things have been this quiet for me. <laughs> it's so quiet. <laughs> you okay, Hina? I hear someone calling me and open my eyes. Guess I fell asleep at some point. I rub my eyes and look around. I'm at my grandparents' house, the place I spent all my summer vacations. The living room had a beautiful view of the garden, as well as a grand piano. I used to love playing it. Whenever I'd finish a piece, the whole family would compliment me. They said my playing was incredible. Those moments were the only time I could make my family smile. The only time I could truly bring them together. Though I was young, I felt proud to have such a power. It's now a memory I keep locked deep inside my heart. Later, much later, my family changed. Mom got reckless with her spending. When her debts finally came to light, Dad started to crack under the pressure. Dad used to be so serene, but now he yelled all the time. And Mom started to get new bruises. I couldn't accept how things had changed, so I just ignored it. But I kept a smile on my face even as I was unable to stop my family from falling apart. My days were a long, dark tunnel with no end. And all I could do was keep walking forward. And though I prayed for help, I knew my pleas would go unanswered. Hina? Wake up, Hina. Guess I fell asleep. Look who's finally up. Uh, Papa? How did you... My love for you led me straight here. Might have bruised myself breaking through some walls, though. Also, it's my job to get you home. Okay, kiddo? Thanks. Looky there! Do my eyes deceive me? Or is that a key? You think it'll open the door in the back? Now we can blow this popsicle stand. Were you sad without old Pop around? No, I wouldn't say that. the third scarecrow.
The light of the sun gently illuminates the princess as it awakens from slumber. Though she warned the sailor boy of his fate, he continues to come see her. She knows he will be back again today. Day after day, he flashes a daring grin as he fabricates tales of adventure. He wants so badly to see her smile. And at some point, she finds herself taken with him. The boy appeared before her like a bird that rules over the free skies. Perhaps she can flee her kingdom prison with him, and only him. She arrives in the palace courtyard. The sailor boy greets her with a confident grin. She stares at him from behind her veil. She can feel him looking at her. Not her riches, not her status, her. Yet though she so desperately wants to believe his heart to be true, she cannot shake her doubts. After a moment of thought, she decides to test him. She walks toward him. In a faint voice no louder than a whisper, she graces him with a plea. Elated, he leaves the palace, thinking to have finally obtained the princess's heart for himself. But she knows the truth. When they next meet, it will be clear if he truly sees her or not. Alas, there is a demon whose sharp eyes see through the princess's intentions. The princess and fortune teller stand together in her room. The princess has come up with a plan to test the sailor boy. Will he see the rich clothes of her lady-in-waiting and assume she is his prize? In her guise as fortune teller, she can only pray he makes the right decision. Concealing herself, she waits. At last, the sailor comes to the princess's room. As the scene unfolds, her heart sinks in her chest.
sailor does not recognize the lady in waiting in disguise and quickly spirits her away. The sailor boy is just another grain of sand in an uncaring desert. And short-lived as it was, the princess curses herself for permitting her heart to feel joy. The one person she most wanted to see her wasn't even looking at her. But you would notice if someone else showed up in my outfit, wouldn't you? Um, I don't know. There are way more buildings there now. And you'd be right. It's proof we're getting closer to your world. Well, ain't that just a kick in the teeth? <laughs> are you imitating your old man, kiddo? I don't know. Am I? This is the fourth Scarecrow, and the last. Let's see what happens to the thief and the princess. Mm. A lonely wind dances through the nighttime city. In fortune teller's garb, the princess follows the sailor boy and her lady-in-waiting, who is still disguised as herself. She orders her guards to kill the sailor. For what meaning has his life if he does not see her for who she truly is? She thinks back on the day they first met. He spun a magical tale of traveling the world. From the day of her birth, the princess has been bound to the stone that is her kingdom. But the boy came to speak with her countless times, eventually setting her heart aflame. She had so desperately wished to fly to freedom with him. But now her heart lays in ashes. She has been betrayed, undone. It has been a long time since she smelled the salt of the sea. The beach is unnaturally quiet, the sand darkened with blood. What awaits the princess is a truth she can scarcely believe. The sailor boy is protecting her disguised lady-in-waiting. The boy risks his life to protect a false princess. Yet the true one sees it as a fruitless act. I am the princess. But her silent scream echoes only in her mind.
As the battle in the bay continues, dawn encroaches on the territory of night. When sun and moon meet in the sky, they point their blades at one another. I will not let you have the princess! You know nothing of the princess! You do not see her true self! Nonsense! I'm the only one who can make her smile! Don't stand in the way of our freedom! Why? I wanted you to look at me and only me, yet my wish never came true! Why? At the end of the battle, the sailor boy falls unconscious, steadfast, in his decision to stay with the princess to the bitter end. Though the princess finds her will to live fading, one last idea comes to her. She will set to sea with the boy, and they will slip the mortal coil as one. The sea glimmers in the morning light, a silent watcher as sailor and princess cross its waters. Here the kingdom cannot reach them, here a girl is not bound to her royal status. As the sailor awakens, his expression twists into one of hatred. No one had ever seen the princess for who she truly is. She has been destined to forever be a symbol. Yet before her stands a mere boy who only wanted the princess's smile for himself. We... We... Tangled in an ironic embrace, we sink into the sunless depths. I stare at her with pure hate as the moonlight washes over us. I smile then, for he is finally looking at me, and only me. Their brief meeting ultimately brought them here. My wish is granted at long last, and I take it with me. Into, Into the, the depths, depths of, of the, the cold, cold, cold sea. <sighs> and that takes care of that. Boy, we're really running out of time here. When the four suns, no, no, the four keys come together. Hmm. 
Hina. Oh, what should I do? Oops, time to focus. Both of their wishes came true in the end. But in such a sad way. Mm. Nice job, kiddo. Oh, you worked real hard. This is the last soul fragment. All the pieces are in place for you to fix the broken sun. Now let's get going. The sun is powerful enough to grant wishes. That's what you said, right? Yep, sure is. We keep going this way. Hmm. Say, kiddo, if someone else had to get hurt in the process of achieving your goal, would you still do it? That came out of nowhere. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I'm not even sure there's a right answer to that. We have my own past. <clears throat> Wishes always come with a price. Are you sure? You're right. A girl hurries through a darkened city to her job. Her life with her father, as well as the lives of countless others, hang delicately in the balance. No matter how disheartened she may be, she bears the weight of her sins alone. All for the small, fragile happiness she has with her father. Graduation season soon approaches the Metropolitan High School. Echoes of excited students fill the after-school hallways. Summoned by her homeroom teacher, the girl makes her way to the faculty room. The students' unusual murmurs cause unease to swell in her chest like a wave. As she announces herself, the teachers turn as one to look at her. She makes her way through the uncomfortable atmosphere as quietly as possible. Her teachers used to await each of her tests with the pride of heightened expectations. But now they merely stare at her with disappointment. 
His words drop like a stone. They received a report that she has been selling drugs in the city. As a result, her offer to join an upstanding company after graduation has been rescinded. And as if adding insult to injury, she hears that she is to be suspended. Once the scolding is done, the girl wanders out of the office in a daze. All of her hard work has blown away like chaff in the wind. And horrible rumors are now racing through the school hallways like wildfire. She has nothing left but sorrow and despair, and so she gives herself over to them. An inky sun rises in her heart. She walks on, guided by its dismal light. Cruel words swirl and eddy all about, forming a swift denial of her entire life. Unable to bear the strife in her heart, she finally stops running. She remembers what she and her father said to one another when she was young. Even when her mother scolded her. Even when she fought with her brother. Her father had always been on her side. After a moment, she begins to walk once more. She walks so she might stay with her beloved father and smile at him like the sun. All that awaits her outside of the school is the endless worried path home. By the time she makes up her mind to tell her father the truth, the sun has long since vanished. Their house is quiet as a grave. Believing her father to be asleep, she whispers, I'm home.
After a moment, she gropes for the light. What she sees is beyond her worst nightmares. The empty shell of her father swings slowly in the gloom. His hollow eyes, worn down by this painful reality, stare upon his only daughter. Her heart tears apart and shatters in her chest. Her last ray of sunlight flickers and dies. And as tears begin to form around the corner of her eyes, she finds herself tumbling into an endless dark. If only she was never here. If only... I did everything I could. I tried my best at school and work, no matter how hard things got. All so I could see Dad smile again. So then why? Why me? Hina. Let's keep going. Once you repair the sun, you can do the same with your past. It's time for you to fulfill the purpose of your journey. This is our last stop, Hina. It's the place in the cage closest to the sun. And the spot closest to your world. Makes me sad knowing this is the end of our travels together. I've never been this close to the sun before. <sighs> Hina, actually... Oh, never mind this old man. Come on, follow me.
You'll find the altar of the sun at the top of these stairs. If you offer your fragments to it, you can fix the broken sun. Listen, Hina. I know that no matter what happens up there, you'll get through it. I know it from the bottom of my heart. So please. <sighs> Papa, I've... I felt lighter since meeting you. It sometimes felt like I was talking to Dad during better times. <laughs> okay, kiddo. This is your last big job. Good luck out there. Thanks. Off I go. Tell me, kiddo. How do you want to change your past? I want to... So the time has finally arrived, Hina. Yuzuki, it's time for your wish to come true. Tell me, Yuzuki. How do you want to change your past? I want to save Mom. Warm sunlight pools through the window. The only sound in the apartment is the buzz of a refrigerator. Within the room, a lone boy slumbers. Now awake, his gaze quietly scans the room. This is his home, just as he remembers it. He has a faint recollection of his mother making breakfast. But it is a memory's whisper 
nothing more. He recalls traversing stone towers in an attempt to save his mother. He shakes his head, telling himself it was all a dream. But then, there comes a voice he does not expect to hear. The boy heads to the entrance, eager to see if the speaker is who he thinks it is. Standing there is his mother, who should be in the hospital. Look at you, sleepyhead, she says with a cheerful smile. She's happy, an emotion he's not seen in years. Tears of relief begin to spill from his eyes. The way she says his name is so gentle, so loving. But the boy forces his emotions down and replies, I'm fine, that's nothing. He then makes an earnest wish. A wish for this brief moment of happiness to last forever. The scent of books fills the library of an urban high school. A boy's eyes race across the pages of a complicated technical manual. The only sounds are the scrape of his finger across paper and the faint cries of students outside. The library is a place apart. It is a sanctuary his peace. No one bothers him here, and his mind is free to plunge into mathematical formulae. Numbers and symbols fill the pages of his notebook. As he finishes the proof for a difficult problem, he rises with a satisfied look. The sky settles into a deep flush as he heads home to his mother. Other students suddenly call out to him. Leaving the excited chatter behind him, the boy makes his way to the exit. Though his expression remains the same, the corners of his mouth loosen into a smile. I'm home, he calls, the phrase unnatural on his lips. His mother collapses before his eyes. There is a knife, blood. She is dead beyond all doubt. It is her second death, but this time it was done by his own sister's hand. Pain courses through his head, as though attempting to reject the tragedy before him. And amidst his pain, he hurls curses at his fate.
You used the power of the moon to wish for a quiet life with your mother. But no matter how many times you rewrite the past, Hina Akagi always kills your mother. Same as the time she killed her in the hospital. But I know you haven't forgotten you. Because you bear the same sin. Hatred and animosity royal in the boy's chest. He has come to question his estranged father, the one who abandoned him in the divorce. He informs him that his mother hasn't long to live. He places the blame squarely on the abuse he inflicted upon her. But as he piles on questions and facts, his father interrupts. He cares not that she is dying. Indeed, he seems almost pleased. This is too much. Finally, finally, the boy snaps. He lashes out and murders his father, staging it to look like suicide. This is the truth of it all. The whole reason for this journey was for you to understand that. Because now, it's time for your wish to come true. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'll never forgive her. Never. Never. Hina Akagi. Yuzuki Kurizome. I knew it. You killed Dad. Like you're one to talk. You killed Mom. No matter how much you struggle, you two were always destined to face each other. Just like all the pasts you prepared. Out of my way. I... Get a grip, kid. We're talking about your last living family. That's right. Is fighting her really your only choice? I... I need to avenge my mother. Oh. Looks like your mind is made up. The sword. It's the power you need to make your wish come true. Those with souls of darkness have suffered for long enough. Cast off their cursed chains! Fight by my side. So the time has finally arrived, Yusuki. Hina, it's time for your wish to come true. So, tell me, kiddo. How do you want to change your past? I want to live with my dad. Warm sunlight pools through the window. The apartment is old and filled with dust. Within it, a lone girl slumbers. Now awake, her gaze quietly scans the room. This is her home, a place so full of memories. 
Her father is not to be found in his usual spot. She faintly recalls venturing into a strange world in order to regain a normal life with him. Was it all a dream? Her murmur melts into the quiet of the room. There comes a sudden, kind voice. The girl heads to the entrance, eager to see if the speaker is who she thinks it is. Standing there is her father, dressed in a suit. He offers her a smile and says, Guess what, Pumpkin? I finally found a new job. He is happy. It is an emotion she's not seen on his face in years. She buries her face into his chest and sobs. He responds by saying her name over and over as he strokes her hair. In that moment, she thinks everything will finally be all right. The girl sheds tears in the warmth of her father's embrace. She then makes an earnest wish. A wish for this brief moment of happiness to last forever. Metropolitan High School, the windows have been flung wide to welcome the summer sun. The chatter of students eager to head home fills the halls. A girl emerges from a classroom. Her friend asks her for yet another once-in-a-lifetime favor. All right, says the girl, but you owe me two sodas now. teacher's confidence in her ability could not be more clear. It's because you're a good teacher, responds the girl, giving him a polite smile that reaches the eyes. With a quick invitation, she takes her friend shopping near the train station. She wants to reward herself for doing so well on her tests. home after stopping by the sweets shop near the station. She wants to celebrate her test results with her father over his favorite treat of cream puffs. I'm home, she calls after stepping through the door.
Her father collapses before her eyes. There is a knife. Blood. He is dead beyond all doubt. It is his second death. But this time it was done by her own brother's hand. Pain courses through her head, as though attempting to reject the tragedy before her. Amidst her pain, she hurls curses at her fate. You use the power of the sun to wish for a quiet life with your father. But no matter how many times you rewrite the past, Yuzuki Korizome always kills your father. Same as the time he staged your father's suicide. But I know you haven't forgotten, Hina. Because you bear the same sin. Hatred and animosity royal in the girl's chest. She has come to question her estranged mother, the one who abandoned her in the divorce. She informs her mother that her father has committed suicide. She places the blame squarely on the insurmountable debt her mother left him with. But as she piles on questions and facts, her mother interrupts. She cares not that he is dead. She seems almost pleased. This is too much. Finally, finally, the girl snaps. She fills her mother's IV with poison, ending her life. This is the truth of it all. The whole reason for this journey was for you to understand that. Because now, it's time for your wish to come true.
I'll never forgive him. Never. Never. Yuzuki Kurizome. Hina Akagi. I knew it. You killed Mom. <laughs> like you're one to talk. You killed Dad. No matter how much you struggle, you two were always destined to face each other. Just like all the past you've repaired. Don't get in my way, Papa. I'm going to. Think about it, kiddo. He's your last living family. Is fighting him really your only choice? I... I need to avenge my father. Ah. <sighs> Looks like your mind is made up. This sword... It's the power you need to make your wish come true. Those with souls of light have suffered for long enough. Cast off their cursed chains! Fight by my side! <laughs> We would be friends forever. I was happy just being by your side. If I didn't make things worse, maybe you would have thought. Was it all my fault? Is this what my search for perfection wrought? No. It's all because I place too great a burden on you. Even still, I... Our only choice is to give ourselves over to fate. We wouldn't have needed to take from one another if we'd never met. No. It was fate that we met. Even our misconnections were fate. Sorry. This is the only way we can end this. I will do better next time. <sighs> Let us sink into the depths of the abyss together. only realize what we have once it's gone only then do we understand just how precious it was we're doomed to the same fate as us
waited so long for this. It's all I've lived for since the day Mom died. Whatever. Time for you to get a taste of what Dad went through. I was always jealous of you. Nothing ever faced you. Do you know how much I had to take it just to get by in life? You know nothing about me. I was never okay with being a loner. Or getting made fun of? How could I be? I knew her over and over. I kept wishing I could die, but no one gave a crap. I'm an outsider. I'm nothing. Shut up! This pain is nothing. It's nothing compared to the hell I lived through! Always walk a dark path. Alone. Crushed by the weight of reality. The conflict I felt made me hate the entire world. And in the end, all I had was my own voice crying out. And, and that's why I have to. to.
Ina? Hmm. Yuzuki finally got his wish, right? That means our job's done. But Mama... This doesn't feel right to me. I don't like it either. There must have been a different way this could have ended. I've always walked a dark path. Alone. Crushed by the weight of reality. The conflict I felt made me hate the entire world. And in the end, all I had was my own voice crying out. And, and that's, that's why, why I have to. Yuzuki. Oh, Yuzuki. Don't cry, Mama. <sighs> Hina finally got her wish. That means our job's done. But it just doesn't feel right. There must have been a different way this could have ended. Idiot! 
Looks like we're never going back to our world, huh? I guess we're supposed to stay in the cage. A fitting place for wicked people who committed grave sins. God, you're such a nerd. Oh, lay off. Oh. Goodness, I think I may have uh, dropped my purse somewhere. Well, well, uh, why don't you two go on ahead? Hmm? All right. Even so, someone's gonna need to look after those kids. And, and that's, that's our job. job.